I am so grateful uh, for all of you uh, hosting me here today, and I can't say enough about Henry Nicholas and the outstanding work that he's done on behalf of workers who uh, so often have been forgotten, so often uh, have been left behind. He has been a warrior and a, and a battler for justice for so many years. Please give Henry a big round of applause. I'm grateful for his support. Thank you. To all the officers in the AFL-CIO, to my dear friends from SEIU, Andy Stern and Anna Berger, to a, a great supporter and a great friend, Congressman Shaka Fatah, who I know just walked in. There he is right there. And most of all, to the President of the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO, who has done such a magnificent job helping to pull labor together. We were talking uh, briefly, and he was explaining to me how Pennsylvania has been going blue because unions have been organized, membership has been growing, we have been going democratic again and again and again in Pennsylvania. Thanks to his leadership, please give Billy George a big round of applause. I have had a wonderful time traveling all across Pennsylvania over the last several days. I have uh, visited uh, steel mills, I've visited apparel shops, I've uh, visited a chocolate shop, uh, and I played basketball with Bob Casey, <laughs> and I went bowling. <laughs> and and, and my, my poll numbers dropped a little bit after the bowling, but which is why I'm going to tear up the bowling alley in the White House. We're putting up a basketball court. Maybe I should leave it in there and get a little practice. But you know, we meet here at a time of challenge and uncertainty for American workers and for Pennsylvania's workers. I've been hearing it uh, over the last several days and over the last year and some months that I've been running for president. We all know the stories of shuttered plants, rusting factories, of industrial centers that have become near ghost towns across this state and across the country. But today's gathering isn't the first time that workers have met in Philadelphia at a pivotal moment. 181 years ago, in the fall of 1827, a group of mechanics met in the shadow of Independence Hall to form what they called the Mechanics Union of Trade Associations, a moment that marked the birth of the trade union movement in America. They met all kinds of resistance from employers and wealthy merchants who said that they were trying to do things that would hurt workers in business. It was just plain un-American, they were told. But these mechanics, these founding fathers of organized labor disagreed. And in the preamble to their Constitution, they proposed what many believed was a radical idea, that it was in their employers' interests to pay them higher wages because higher wages for workers would help bring general prosperity for all. It was the 19th century equivalent of the idea that what's good for Main Street is good for Wall Street. And that, that's an idea we need to remember today. Because what we're seeing is another very different view that's taken hold in Washington and on Wall Street. The view that we can somehow thrive as a nation when those at the very top are doing better than ever while ordinary Americans are struggling to get by. Over the last seven years, we've had an administration that serves the interests of the wealthy and the well-connected no matter what the cost to working families and to our economy. It's an administration that didn't lift a finger while our economy rolled toward recession until the pain the play, uh, pain that people were feeling on Main Street started trickling up to their friends on Wall Street. 
It's an administration that's been handing out tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans who don't need them and weren't even asking for. It's an administration that denies labor a seat at the table when trade deals are being negotiated, that doesn't believe in unions, that doesn't believe in organizing, that's packed the Labor Relations Board with their corporate buddies. That's the administration that we've been dealing with for the last seven years. Now John McCain said a few weeks ago that the issue of economics is not something I've understood as well as I should. And that's clear, because all he's offering is more of the same Bush policies that have put the American dream out of reach for so many Americans. Like George Bush, Senator McCain is committed to more tax cuts for the rich, more trade agreements that fail to protect American workers. His response to the housing crisis amounts to basically standing on the sidelines and watching millions of Americans face foreclosure. Some of his top advisors were lobbyists for the special interests when they went to work for his campaign, so it's not hard to guess who they'll be working for if they get into the White House. So while I know there's been some talk about whether the Democrats will be unified in November, understand this, America can't afford another four years of the Bush policies, and that's what John McCain's offering, and that's why I know we'll come together this fall to bring this country the change we so desperately need. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. I've been traveling all across this country for the last 15 months. And when I started running, people said, Barack, why are you running so soon? Why are you running this time? You know, you're a relatively young man. You can afford to wait. And I explained to them I'm running because of what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now, because I believe there's such a thing as being too late. And that hour is almost upon us. We are at a defining moment in our history. This nation just marked the fifth anniversary of a war that I believe should have never been authorized and should have never been waged. We've lost 4,000 plus of the bravest young Americans. The war that needs to be won in Afghanistan is slipping into chaos. And here at home, everywhere I go, all across Pennsylvania, what do you hear? You hear people struggling, working harder and harder just to get by. Their wages and incomes have flatlined while Bush has been in office. This is the first economic expansion that we've just completed over the last seven and a half years where people's incomes were actually lower at the end of it on average than before the expansion started. People have never paid more for health care, never paid more for a college education, never paid more for a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk. It's harder to save. It's harder to retire. And the worst part is people have lost faith, they've lost trust that anybody in Washington is listening to them. You know, the problems we face go beyond any single administration. For far too long, through both Democratic and Republican administrations, the system's been rigged against everyday Americans by the lobbyists that Wall Street uses to get its way. Think about it. The top mortgage lenders spend $185 million lobbying Congress, and we wonder why Washington looked the other way when they were tricking families into buying homes they couldn't afford. Drug and insurance companies. Drug and insurance companies spent $1 billion on lobbying, and we're surprised that our health care premiums and our co-pays and the cost of prescription drugs go up year after year after year, and key providers in the healthcare industry, nurses and workers, all they get is more hours, less pay. 
The big oil companies play the same game, and we wonder how they're making record profits at a time when you're paying close to $4 for a gallon of gas. Brothers and sisters, the system is broken. The system is broken. And over the weekend, we got a reminder of just how badly broken it is. You might have seen it. There was a news story about the top two executives at Countrywide Financial. This is a company that is as responsible as any firm in the country for the housing crisis we're facing today. They were out there peddling predatory loans and engaging in practices that were questionable, luring people into homes they couldn't afford. And what we learned is that when Countrywide was sold a few months ago, these two executives got a combined $19 million. Millions of Americans are facing foreclosure, our economy is in turmoil, and the guys behind it are getting bonuses for their bad behavior. That is an outrage. That's not what America <laughs> believes in. It's time to take on those special interests and level the playing field so that our economy works for working Americans. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. somebody in Washington who is thinking about workers. And that's why when I decided to run, what I realized was that the size of our challenges had outstripped the capacity of a broken politics to solve. I believe that the American people and the union movement wanted a politics that was not about tearing each other down, but was about lifting the country up. That we wanted not spin and PR, but straight talk and honesty from our political leadership. But most of all, I was betting on you. I was betting on all of you sitting here today and all the members you represent all across the Pen state of Pennsylvania and all the working people all across this country. Because I am absolutely convinced that change does not happen from the top down. Change happens from the bottom up. Change happens when ordinary people do extraordinary things. When we unify black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, we come together to challenge the special interests, to challenge ourselves to be better, to challenge this country to be better. There is nothing we can't do when we are unified, and that's what the labor movement's about, and that's what America should be about. talk about Rocky Balboa over the last couple of days. And, and you know, we all love Rocky. We all love Rocky. And, and the last time I checked, I was the underdog in this state. So, so, the, uh, so, so you know I like the Rocky story, but we got to remember, Rocky was a movie. And so is the idea that somebody can fight for working people and at the same time embrace the broken system in Washington, where corporate lobbyists use their clout to shape laws to their liking. We need to challenge the system on behalf of America's workers. And if we're not willing to take up that fight, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans, will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. I believe I can bring about the kind of change that's needed because I'm the only candidate in this race who's actually worked to take power away from lobbyists by passing historic ethics reform in Illinois and in the United States Senate. I'm the only candidate who isn't taking a dime of Washington lobbyist money. They have not funded my campaign, they will not run my administration, and they will not drown out the voices of the American people when I'm President of the United States of America. Your voices will be heard. This isn't just campaign talk. I've been fighting for working families ever since I moved to Chicago, more than two decades ago. I worked as a community organizer on the streets 
in the shadow steel mills that had closed, giving job training to the jobless, hope to the hopeless, when thousands had been laid off. And the reason I'm standing here as one of you is because I don't want to wake up one morning many years from now and see that nothing's changed because the system's still being rigged against America's families. I know you don't want that either. Because despite seven years of the most anti-labor administration in generations, despite George Bush basically saying you're on your own instead of we're in it together, as I look out on this crowd, as I travel across this country and across this great state, the one thing I know for certain is that the labor unions are still mobilizing. Labor unions are still organizing. Labor unions are still fighting to give America's working people a voice in Washington. Labor unions are on the rise. Don't let anybody tell you different. And I want to be part of that rise all across America. I've, I said it before, and I'll say it again. I am tired of playing defense. I know the AFL-CIO is tired of playing defense. We're ready to play some offense. We're ready to play offense for a decent wage. We're ready to play offense for retirement security. We're ready to play offense for universal health care. It's time to stand up to the big drug and insurance companies that have been blocking reform and saying enough is enough. We're going to finally make health care affordable and available for every single American. I put forward a plan that says everybody should have health care that is at least as good as the health care I have as a member of Congress. You guys are paying my salary. I shouldn't have better health care than you. We're going to finally help people like the young woman I met who works the night shift after a full day of college and still can't afford medicine for a sister who's ill. No American should be driven into bankruptcy trying to pay their medical bills. No worker should have to go without a pay raise because their employer has to use the money to cover the rising costs of health care. That's why we will pass universal health care. That's why we're not going to make it's so expensive that people can't afford it, or we're not going to have folks excluded for pre-existing conditions. That's why we're not going to balance Medicaid or Medicare budgets on the back of hard-working health care workers. That's why we're not going to wait 20 years from now to do it or 10 years from now to do it. I am going to do it by the end of my first term as President of the United States of America. In this country, of all countries, health care should be available for everybody not a privilege of the few, a fundamental right for every American. We're ready to play some offense for organized labor. It's time we had a president who didn't choke saying the word union. It's time we had a Democratic nominee who doesn't just talk about unions during the primary? We need a, a president who knows it's the Department of Labor and not the Department of Management. A president who strengthens our unions by letting them do what they do best, organize our workers. If a majority of workers want a union, they should get a union. It's that simple. Let's stand up to the business lobby that's been getting their friends in Washington to block card check. It is time to pass Employee Free Choice Act in the Senate, and I will make it a law of the land when I'm President of the United States of America. offense for working families. I, early in this race, called for a middle class tax cut, rolling back those Bush tax cuts, give working families a break, have them save up to $1,000 a year, including 6 million people in this state. I've said we should eliminate income taxes entirely 
for seniors making under $50,000 a year. We have to do more to make sure people who are getting laid off in these hard times still have enough money to make ends meet, which is why I'm working with my friend Senator Bob Casey to extend unemployment insurance and making it available for working folks who aren't in a union and don't work a regular nine to five job. But we have to do more over the long term to invest in our middle class. And that's what we'll do when I'm president, to ensure that our children have the skills to compete in our global economy. We're going to make college affordable with a $4,000 tuition credit. Every student, every year. Now, students won't get it for free. They're going to have to invest in community service, spend some time in a homeless shelter, spend some time in a veteran's home, join the Peace Corps. We'll invest in them. They'll invest in America. Together, we'll march this country forward. We're going to pass what I've called the Patriot Employer Act. I've been fighting for it ever since I ran for the Senate because we're going to take away tax breaks from companies that ship jobs overseas. We are going to give those tax breaks to companies that invest right here in the United States of America. That just makes common sense. I propose creating millions of new jobs in a fiscally responsible way, investing $60 billion over the next 10 years to rebuild crumbling roads and bridges, setting broadband lines all across America, fixing our locks and our dams. This will generate millions of new jobs, many of them in the construction industry that's been hard hit by our housing crisis. But it will also create long-term competitiveness for this economy. And for those who say we can't afford to invest in America, all I know is, if we are spending $10 billion a month in Baghdad, I know we can spend billions of dollars right here in America, putting Americans back to work, creating a stronger economy for the future. That just makes sense, and that's what I'll do when I'm President of the United States of America. It's time Washington started the same showing the same kind of leadership that Pennsylvania's labor movement's shown by fighting to create green jobs that are the jobs of the future. I will invest $150 billion over the next decade to establish a green energy sector, creating 5 million new jobs, jobs that pay well and can't be outsourced. We're going to transform shuttered steel mills to make windmills. Plants that have closed will make solar panels. We will hire union workers to make buildings more energy efficient. We are going to work with the automakers to make cars that get more mileage on a gallon of gas because we've got to reduce demand, stop our dependence on foreign oil. That's how we're going to bring gas prices down in the long term, although in the short term, we've got to go after those windfall profits that those oil companies are making, make them invest in refinery capacity because it is a crime. When ordinary people can't get to the job, while Exxon Mobil's making $11 billion in quarterly profits, and thanks to leaders like my friend Congressman Patrick Murphy, these new green jobs in the energy sector are bringing back to life places that have been hard hit in recent decades, places like Fairless Hills in Bucks County, where the old U.S. steel plant's now being used to make wind turbines. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge that we can't completely stop globalization in its tracks. Automation is here. Technology is here. We're going to be opening up new markets that our goods can help, uh, that, that we can sell and strengthen our economy. But what I refuse to accept is that we have to sign trade deals like the South Korea Agreement that are bad for American workers. What I oppose and what I will always oppose are trade deals that put the interests of Wall Street ahead of the interests of American workers. That's why I oppose NAFTA. That's why I voted against CAFTA. That's why it didn't make sense to normalize trade relations with China without asking more from China. I will oppose the Columbia Free Trade Agreement if George Bush is insistent on sending it to Congress because the violence against unions in Colombia would make a mockery 
of the very labor protections that we've insisted be included in these kinds of agreements. You can trust me when I say that whenever trade deals we negotiate come to my desk, they are going to be good for American workers, that they'll have powerful labor and environmental protections, and that we will enforce those protections. These are the battles we should be fighting. This is the future we should be building. It's going to be hard to do all this so long as we're spending $10 billion a month fighting a war in Iraq. I oppose this war from the start. It was an unwise war. I've opposed it each year it's been going on. That's why I'm the only candidate who will offer a real choice in November, because I can stand up to John McCain with credibility. And when you ask yourselves who you want answering that 3 o'clock in the morning phone call, you should ask yourself who's going to ask for the good intelligence? Who's going to weigh the costs and the benefits? Who's going to have the strategic vision to understand that we shouldn't be distracted from going after al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, the ones who caused 3,000 Americans to die? That's the person that you want answering that phone call. You want somebody debating John McCain who said no to the war in Iraq and will say no to a 100-year occupation of Iraq and say no to a third Bush term. It is time to bring our troops home. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. It's time to end the fight in Iraq. It's time to end the fight in Iraq and take up the fight for good jobs and universal health care. It's time to end the fight in Iraq and take up the fight for a world-class education and social security. It's time to take up the fight for opportunity and prosperity here at home. So make no mistake, the American people have a choice in this election. We can keep playing the same Washington game with the same Washington players and somehow expect a different result. Or we can choose a different future. Just imagine it. Imagine a president whose life story is like so many of your own. Who knows what it's like to go to college on student loans or to see his mother sick and worry that maybe she can't pay the medical bills. Imagine a Washington where the only influence that lobbyists have will be on the sidelines because it's the people's lobby that will count. A Washington where you can trust that your voice will be heard before any major piece of labor legislation is signed into law. Imagine an America that lives up to the idea that those mechanics proposed nearly 200 years ago, where we finally have a system that works for Main Street and not just Wall Street. That's the change we seek. That's the vision the AFL-CIO has always fought for. That's the future that's within our grasp, but I can't, I can't do it by myself. I can't do it by myself. I've got to do it with you. Some of you heard uh, people were shouting as we were coming in about uh, saying they were fired up. I've told some folks in SEIU this story. I, I just want to repeat it real quick about where I first heard that phrase. I was traveling uh, in South Carolina at a legislative meeting. And I'd been asked to be the speaker, and I was sitting next to a state legislator there. And this is early in the campaign. I wasn't getting a lot of endorsements back then. People couldn't even pronounce my name. <laughs> and I said to this legislator, I, you know, I'd love your support. And she looks at me and she says, Obama, I will come, I, I, will, I will give you your, uh, an endorsement if you come to my hometown of Greenwood, South Carolina. Greenwood, South Carolina. And I must have had a drink that day because I just said, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> and it turns out that Greenwood is remote. <laughs> Greenwood's about an hour and a half from every place else. <laughs> Nobody had told me that. So about a month later, I fly into South Carolina. I'm going to, a, I fly into another city and I've been traveling for 10 straight days. I'm exhausted. I've missed my wife. I miss my kids. Uh, and I get to the hotel room about midnight, and I'm dragging my bags in, looking forward to sleep. And suddenly, my staff member taps me on the shoulder and says, 
Uh, Senator, I said, what? They said, we've got to be up at 6 in the morning and be in the car. I said, why? He said, because we've got to go to Greenwood like you promised. So the next morning, I wake up, and I feel worse than when I went to bed. I feel terrible. And I dr drag myself out of bed. I go over to the window shades. I, I pull open the shades, hoping to get a little sunlight, wake me up. It's a miserable day, pouring down rain outside. I go try to fix myself some coffee and, and go get the newspaper outside the door, open it up. There's a bad story about me in the New York Times. <laughs> I, uh, I pack up my things. I go downstairs. My umbrella blows open, and I got soaked. I'm poured on. So by the time I get into the car, I am wet, I'm sleepy, and I'm mad. And we start driving to Greenwood. And we drive, and we drive, and we drive. Finally, an hour and a half later, we get to Greenwood, although you don't know you're in Greenwood right away. <laughs> there aren't a lot of tall buildings in Greenwood. We pull alongside some fields, and then there's a park, and then there's a little field house. We go inside the field house. After this long drive, I go inside. Lo and behold, there are only about 20 people there, 20 people after an hour and a half drive. And they all look like they've been rained on and that they're not all that cheerful to see me. <laughs> but, you know, I had a job to do. I'm running for president. We know every vote counts, so I'm shaking hands. I'm saying, how do you do? What do you do? Nice to see you. Good to meet you. Suddenly, I hear this voice behind me shout out, fired up! <laughs> so I don't know what's going on, but everybody else says, fired up. Then I hear this voice say, ready to go! And I, everybody says, ready to go. And, I, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I look behind me. There's this little old woman, not that old, uh, but older. She's about 5'3". Uh, she's dressed like she's going to church. She has a big church hat. And she looks at me, and she smiles, and she says, fired up! <laughs> Turns out that... She is a city councilwoman from Greenwood who was famous for her chant. She's been doing this for years. Everywhere she goes, she loves to chant. She says, fire it up. Everybody says, fire it up. Ready to go, ready to go. And so for the next five minutes, she keeps on doing this. She keeps on saying, fire it up, ready to go. And I'm standing there, and I'm realizing I'm being upstaged by this woman. <laughs> People are paying more attention to her than me. And I look at my staff, and they shrug their shoulders. We don't know how long it's going to go, but, but here's the thing, Philadelphia. After a minute or two, I start realizing I'm feeling kind of fired up. <laughs> I feel like I'm ready to go. <laughs> and so I join in the chant. And for the rest of the day, whenever I saw my staff, I'd say, are you fired up? they say, we're fired up, boss. Are you ready to go? i say, I'm ready to go. It goes to show you how one voice can change a room. And if one voice can change a room, it can change a city. If it can change a city, it can change a state. If it can change a state, it can change a nation. That's what the union movement is about. One voice joining with two voices, joining with a thousand voices, joining with a million voices. If you will march with me and vote for me and work for me, and fight with me, then I promise you, we will not just win Pennsylvania, we will win this general election. And you and I together, we will change this country and change the world. God bless you guys. God bless America.